Good morning. Glad to see you here today. It's a beautiful day to be in the house of the Lord. Uh, the Lord has blessed us with so much, and we're glad that you're here. Let's stand as we sing. We've got a couple of songs this morning. And uh, join us as we sing, please. Blessed be your name is our first one. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place. Though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name when the sun's shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering though there's pain in the offering blessed be your name every blessing you pour out I'll turn back to praise when the darkness closes in Lord still I will say blessed be the name of the Lord Blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. You give and take away, you give and take away, my heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. Give and take away, you give and take away, my heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. Amen and amen. All right, to our next one. What a beautiful name. One with God the Lord Most High Your hidden glory in creation Now revealed in you our Christ What a beautiful name it is What a beautiful name it is the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. 
What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. You didn't want heaven without us, so Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great, your love was greater. What could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a wonderful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus. Death could not hold you. The veil tore before you. Your silence a boast of sin and rain. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory, for you are raised to life again. You have no rival, you have no equal, now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom, yours is the glory, yours is the name above all names. What a powerful name it is, what a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ my King. What a powerful name it is, nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. By his name, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. Please be seated. Lord's house. I have a lot of things to be thankful for. So uh, we've been praying for Amanda and Bo. For two things. One, she asked us to definitely pray. First of all, she would get pregnant, and she got pregnant. And then she said, well, pray that I can have a little girl. Pray, pray. And so we've been praying, and they did a reveal yesterday, and they're going to have a little girl. So, not that they would not take another little boy, but, you know, that was an answer to prayer. So now they um, left are leaving today to go to Tucson to live. And so they said they'd come back and visit, but um, just because of circumstances, so we want to pray for them to find a church home, to find a good job, uh, find a place that they'll be comfortable at. Uh, and his aunt or his cousin that we prayed for last week passed away on Monday. She knew the Lord, but she had uh, kidney issues and liver issues, and so now she's in the Lord's presence. And um, so they're going... Uh, to go to her service, but also to go to move there. So um, we were able to help them. Uh, they asked if we could help them financially, and we said, yes, we would help them. So uh, the church, because of your generosity, was able to help them uh, get a truck to go on their move um, U-Haul. So also, um, David and Vanessa are pregnant. Amen. Amen? So that's an answer to prayer. Okay, I guess... Is it an answer to prayer? Okay, praying for a boy. But you'll take whatever you get. Okay, understand that you are the one that made that decision already. Okay, so don't blame her. All right, 
So those are some answers to prayer. I appreciate those that labored around the church during the week. Uh, we got the hedges clipped. We got the grass mown. Uh, we got a lot of stuff. Uh, Jerry and I went to the dump twice, taking brush that was here. So we got a lot of stuff done, and I thank the Lord for those of you that helped with that. Um, we're starting to do some movement uh, to help get set free, settled in. And so uh, they came and did some work as well, and we're thankful for that. So uh, just blessings, just blessings. Who else has an answer to prayer or a praise the Lord today? And I have a pen so I can start writing this stuff down, all right? So answer to prayer or praise the Lord, anybody? Yes, ma'am. Okay, amen. Reconnection with your niece. Amen, amen. That's great. Suzette, or Susanna. I called Suzette Aunt Suzette this morning. She just sort of looked at me like she didn't know what to expect. All right. Any other answers to prayer? Praise the Lord. Yes. Okay, amen. We'll definitely pray for them, for safe travels. Anyone else? David? I had a sleep study test to see if I had sleep apnea, and I don't. So well, amen. Amen. Don't have to have one of those machines. All right. It's always great to pass those tests. All right. Anybody else? Jer uh, Randy? Okay. Okay. Amen. Pray that he stays safe. Amen. But amen. That was an answer to prayer for him. Okay. Anyone else? Answer to prayer. Praise the Lord. So, yes, ma'am. I have three months today since I quit smoking cigarettes. Amen. 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 Chelsea is doing better. Amen. Okay. And your son wants to get baptized. Yes, he does. All right. So that's an answer to prayer. Yes. Yes, we will definitely pray for them. Well, in Tennessee and Kentucky as well. So pray for those that are going through the shootings, Kentucky, Alabama, Tennessee, as well as those that were affected. Some got hit pretty hard by those tornadoes. I don't know if you saw that, all that was going on. So we want to pray for them as well. Okay. Other prayer requests? Okay. Uh, Nick uh, had a good little interview and session with the work and it would be something more like he'd like to do so we would just pray for him with a work situation pray for Randy with his work situation um, pray for Wendy with a bad biopsy cancer uh, for Sue Wadsworth that's Sarah's mom for Mike's friend Lori uh, with a biopsy in cancer um, Jerry did uh, your neighbor find out anything about the cancer with the daughter with the mouth and have it. it wasn't cancerous. All right, well, that's an answer to prayer then. Amen. Amen. Yes, Darcy? Okay, Darcy's boss's granddaughter um, has had really, for like a couple of years, headaches, fevers, nausea, not able to eat. Um, went on since, and they thought maybe it was a brain tumor, and they had to finally do another test, and they're calling in somebody that's an expert to sort of look at this and uh, trying to figure out what she has, what would make her have all this illness for this period of time. Um, she was very, very depressed because, you know, at 20 years old and, and been struggling with this for two years and they can't seem to find an answer. So Alex is her name. So if you'll pray for her that she can have this. She did get a test done that was very important. We prayed about that, and, uh, but they're getting the response on it. So other requests. 
Well, let's bow our heads in prayer. Yes. Okay. Okay, for students. I know there was a threatened shooting at Bonita Vista High School on Friday. Middle school? Okay. All right, just for our students, our kids. Amen. All right. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for the answers to prayer for Bo and Amanda and for David and Vanessa. We're thankful for those uh, blessings that you brought into their lives. We thank you for uh, Dave's test that he had and possibility of new work for Nick and for uh, Randy being able to get another motorcycle. We thank you for Chelsea, how you're working in her life and uh, with her family. We thank you, Lord, for uh, Jerry's family having safe travels and you've been with them. Uh, we're thankful for working with Tiffany and Ruth and watching over them. Continue to help Ruth to feel better. Help Alex. Uh, help Lori. Help Wendy. Lord, we pray for Linda. We pray for uh, those that are suffering right now because of the shootings in Alabama and Kentucky and Tennessee. And for those who were hit with the tornadoes, we pray for them. We pray for safety of our kids in school. All these things that are happening, Lord, and just the pressures that they're facing, uh, we would ask that you might work to keep them safe. Lord, we, uh, they're precious in your sight, and we ask that you put your hedge of protection around them. We pray for the lost, uh, for uh, Ricardo's family and for uh, Jerry's family and for Liz's family and for Isabel's family as others that need Christ, Lord, um, that you might work to help them find Christ through the Holy Spirit's testimony and that you might work in a great way. Lord, we pray for those that um, should be in church and haven't been in church. We pray that they might return. Lord, just bring people here. I'm thankful for the people that you've brought, the people that you allow me to minister to outside of the church, and we just pray that you might help us to have, uh, to see numbers growing and things happening, people coming to desire to know you more and to grow in, in their walk in Christ. We thank you for the news of the one from the Spanish church that was just recently saved, and we're thankful for that. We're thankful for the one that wants to get baptized, but Lord, we want to see more movement. We want to see more people getting saved and lives changing. We ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right. You guys are dismissed. Well, we're going to finish 1 Corinthians chapter 15 today about we shall all be changed. The verse that I'm quoting from there in that title uh, is that somebody said um, that it should be put up in the nursery because it says, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Get it? Not all the babies in the nursery are going to sleep, but they're probably all going to need to be changed, right? One point or another. But it's not referring to that. It's referring to what happens to us. We talked about how Jesus came and his purpose was to defeat the enemy of death. Oh, death, where is your sting? Well, today, as we finish this chapter out, I know it says 1 Corinthians 5, but it's actually 1 Corinthians 15 where we're going to be at today, um, is a great explanation of the resurrection. And remember, we said last week that if the resurrection didn't happen, if Jesus' di resurrection didn't happen, then we have no hope. We have no hope for the future. We might as well just close the doors up and, and leave and never get back together again. But in these particular verses that we're going to look at today, we're going to see how the resurrection of Jesus and the victory over death will affect us. What it does for me. Because... For 2,000 years, these words have been read and have spoken, and yet our loved ones still pass. Bo's cousin passed. Michi passed. Don passed. Shirley passed. You know, uh, Wayne is in uh, hospice care, and who knows what's gonna, how long that he's going to linger. Uh, there come a time, I, I at one time thought 61 was pretty old, but I've made it there. I'm going to be 62 this year. And uh, wow, 
Jerry and I were talking to somebody. He said, yeah, I'm 69. And he said, I was young. And I, I thought, man, you look a lot older than I do at 62. Uh, and I said, Jerry's 84 and walks three miles. And the guy's like, wow. Okay? But we know that it doesn't matter if you're in bad health or good health. Uh, we need to pray for Chelsea's brother as he's nearing the end of his life and her family as they deal with that. Jer Jeremy, he's been on our prayer sheet. But death comes, right? Well, pastor, you say that we can have everlasting life. What exactly does that mean? Well, see, the world thinks that we evolved and we're just, uh, we came from monkeys. Uh, and so when we die, that's it. It's just this end of existence. That's not what the Bible tells us. The Bible tells us that whether you are a believer or not, you have eternal soul. You is going to be alive either in heaven with Christ, that comes from believing, or in hell where you're going to be in torments forever. That we were made from conception to think of a baby from conception having a soul that will live eternally. So what does that look like? So the first thing we want to look at today is what will my resurrected body be like? What will my resurrected body be like? Jesus, we told you that the stone didn't have to be moved away for Jesus to come out of the tomb. And Jesus appeared in their midst a couple of times. The doors and the windows were locked. And he appeared there in front of them and spent time with him and, and said to Thomas, put your fingers in my wounds. See that I'm real. And he ate. He ate fish and, and had a drink with them. And so we know that Jesus had a physical body, but he could come into a room and then the doors and windows were locked. He just disappeared. When he was with them on the road to Emmaus, they didn't recognize him at first until he said who he was. John gives us a beautiful description of what the glorified Jesus looks like, what he really looks like in Revelation chapter 1. You can read that to see what he looks like. And I'm not saying we're going to look like that, but our body, I believe, number one, that we will have a form. I've heard some people speculate, maybe at the peak of life, which is somewhere in the early 30s. Those of you that are in your early 30s, Congratulations, you're at the peak of life. You start going downhill after that. But that will be recognizable. Uh, Jesus said there's no marriage or giving of marriage in heaven, so uh, we won't be having babies in heaven. Amen, ladies? Isn't that a wonderful thing? You don't have to worry about that. There's a church group that teaches that. But we won't hunger or thirst anymore, although we'll be able to eat. Somebody said calories won't affect us anymore. You can have all the Mountain Dew you want. I can have all the Dr. Pepper I want, if it's there, okay? We don't know that it's there. But what is my resurrected body going to be like? I believe that I'll be able to recognize my wife, and I'll know that it's Darcy. Whether or not uh, God will answer my prayer and put our houses right next door to each other, or God will answer her prayer and put them on the opposite sides of heaven, uh, we don't know. But I believe I'll be able to recognize my dad. I've got plenty of pictures of him when he was 30, when he was 40, till he passed away. I believe I'll be able to recognize my brother that passed, Timothy, that lived two days. But what will that resurrected body be like? Well, let's read a little bit about it here in this chapter. Starting in verse 35. Ah, <sighs> Wow. All right, here we go. I'm ahead of myself. But someone will say, How are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Foolish one, what you sow is not made alive unless it dies. Have you ever planted something in the ground? A grain of corn to see it grow up? Or maybe uh, you buy tomato plants, I know, but a lot of people grow things from seeds, right? That doesn't look like the finished product, does it? It's pictured on the package, but that's not reality. 
Um, we were feeding the chickens, and some of their, well, they called it scratch, got on the ground underneath. And then when we moved the chicken pen, there was stuff that looked like corn coming up. But it never grew ears. But I took a picture of it and researched it and found out it wasn't corn and after all, it was something else that uh, was in their feed. But when we plant something, it, it doesn't, it's not made alive unless it dies. But it doesn't look like the finished product. And what you sow, you do not sow that body that shall be, but mere grain, perhaps wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body as he pleases, and to each seed its own body. All flesh is not the same flesh. But there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of animals, another of fish, another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies. So there's bodies in space and there's bodies. And it's not talking about a human body. It's just talking about how things might be different in the universe than we know here. The glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. The earth is not like the sun. Is the earth like Mars? A little bit. Mer Mercury and Venus? No. Jupiter? Saturn? No. The earth is different. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the stars. For one star, a glory of the moon, another glory of the stars. For one star differs from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. From the moment you're born, your body, your body starts to die. And as you get older, things begin to happen. When you're in your 20s, you feel, I can do anything. I can get away with anything. I can perform great feats. But you look at athletes that begin to age, and they're not quite as quick or athletic as they used to be because they're getting older. The same thing, you know, I, people would say, yeah, I can tell when the change of weather is coming. How's that? Because my joints ache from arthritis. Have, how many of you suffer from arthritis in some way, shape, or form? Okay? Uh, those of you that didn't raise your hand, it's going to get there to you. Okay? All kinds of things, because this body is not, was made to live forever at the very beginning, but then we sinned. And with sin comes death and destruction, and so I'm slowly dying. And organs will fail, and eventually. Uh, I, I, I feel for Jed because his kidneys have failed, and he has to have dialysis. All right? He's not that old, and it's really hard on him at his young age. But this body is corrupt physically, spiritually, because of sin. So we could call it my Adam suit. Right? And I'm made in the likeness of Adam. Ladies, you're made in the likeness of Eve. It's sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. When we get to heaven, no sin allowed. When we get to heaven, there's no more sickness, no more pain, no more death. All the tears will be wiped away from our eyes. Wow. My human body right now can't go into heaven. Can't be in God's presence. It's sown in dishonor. It's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. Will I be able to do like Jesus did and go from this room outside without going through the doors and the windows? I don't know. That would be a neat trick. Sort of like the shows we used to watch on TV. Right? The guy that was the Martian that had the antennas went up and then he would just, or Bewitched or some of those other shows that you could come and go, you know? We have always thought that'd be really cool. I could just be, want to be somewhere and be transported there like Star Trek. Right? I don't know if that's what our, natural, what our spiritual body, but the Bible tells us that what you are right now can't get to heaven. It's got to change. 
There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, and afterward the spiritual. So we have to live the natural flesh first before we can be made spiritual. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. A little boy went to Sunday school one day, and when he got home from church, um, his parents noticed that he was in the bedroom underneath his bed. And they were like, what are you doing under the bed? And he's trying, he said, I'm trying to find out uh, uh, if my lesson in Sunday school was correct. And she goes, well, what was your lesson in Sunday school? And he said, well, God made Adam out of the dust. And she said, well, what? what? And he goes, well, there's a whole bunch of dust under my bed, and I'm sort of watching to see if God's going to make somebody else under there. It's not real good for mom cleaning up, huh? But we're made out of dirt. And well, what happens? To dirt will return this part of my body. Okay? If it's not embalmed, if they don't go, if Darcy doesn't take me to the mortuary, eventually this will just be nothing. It'll be dust. As is the heavenly man, Jesus, so also are those who are heavenly will be changed. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. So it may be that we'll be like what Jesus was depicted of. Mary Magdalene didn't recognize him at first until he spoke her name. And he, she recognized, and she wanted to hold on to him, and she said, he said, don't, don't. You can't. But we, Jesus didn't appear as a ghost he appeared in his supernatural or in his spiritual state to the disciples and could come and go, and then he ascended up into heaven. We will have that. In Philippians, it says this, Our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly await for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. So I need to be changed from this Adam suit to a heavenly body that can't sin anymore. Can I, I've been a Christian a long time. Can I still sin? Absolutely. Do I want to? No. Does the temptation come? Yeah. I have to be careful that I don't fall into sin. But when I get to heaven, I won't have to worry about that anymore. The sin will be gone. The desire to sin will be gone. My body will be changed. It has to be planted corruptible, and it will be raised incorruptible. So I'm changed from corruption to incorruption. This body is falling apart. It's sad to say. I don't look like that handsome young man that my wife married 35 years ago. Good thing she still loves me. And she didn't marry me just for my appearance. She married me for who I was. But this body is falling apart. I'll be changed from dishonor, from sin, to glory. From weakness to... I still live in the flesh to power to where I won't do that. From natural to spiritual, we have to be changed. From the image of Adam to the image of Jesus, we have to change. We have to change. It's interesting on social media because when you begin to look at something on your phone, to look it up, or on your computer, social media grabs that and runs with it. And so I was looking at some stuff to get into shape. And so for the longest time, all these advertisements have been on there, how to do exercise as an old man. 
And I'm like, well, why can't I do exercises as a young man? Well, because I'm not a young man. It says you can do these with just so ever many minutes at home in a chair. You don't have to go to the gym. And I'm like, well, maybe I need to look into that because I'm not that young guy that I used to be, but I need to exercise. I need to change before I go into heaven. So how exactly does this all happen? How does the resurrection of my body happen? I have to be changed. I know that. I know that everything will be uh, different from what I am now. So what exactly does that mean? Well, how does the resurrection happen? What's next? All right, we're going to go to verses 50 to 57 of 1 Corinthians 15. Now this I say, brethren that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit corruption. There it is right there. This body can't go to heaven. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be, all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. To be able to live forever, to be able to eat from the tree of life. So when this corruptible is put on incorruption and this mortal is put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So the question is, is exactly how is it going to happen? It's a mystery. Those that are sleeping with the Lord, those that have passed already from this life to the next. So uh, I don't think Michi would mind being used for an example. Uh, Michi passed. She was cremated. And her remains were sent to Michigan where her family had uh, placed her in either a grave or in a, a mausoleum. You say, well, what about that, Pastor? What about cremation? Is it okay for a believer to be cremated? Uh, there are Old Testament passages that talk about how uh, we shouldn't burn the bodies. Um, but it was in sacrifice and worship of false gods. For example, we weren't supposed to, we're not supposed to burn up our babies. That's the god Molech. And people would actually sacrifice their newborn babies to that god to say thanks to that God for producing the baby in the first place. It doesn't make sense to me. It's confusing. But again, throughout the scriptures, it doesn't say anything about cremation. And I know some groups teach that if you're cremated, well, there's no way you get to go to heaven. Well, let's go back. How long has it been since Jesus went up into glory? About 2,000 years? Okay. Um, so... The early Christians, the Jews, when they die, they're not embalmed. They're placed in a tomb where the flesh rots away, and they take the bones, and they put them in a, what's called a bo an ossuary box. And eventually those will decay away, because bones don't last forever unless they're fossilized. So I know that some churches have said, hey, we got the bones of Peter here. Really? Okay, because I think they probably would have just turned to dust by now. Or if you talk about somebody uh, that drowned in the ocean with the Titanic, we're right near the anniversary of that, and the fish ate the body, and the bones just disappeared. Is God going to be able to take that from the dust and create a new body from it? Absolutely. That's what it just said in 1 Corinthians 15. So if, if God needs to take my embalmed body out of a coffin and make it new, he'll do it. But he can do it from a cremation as well. Now you do what God tells you to do. My wife and I have said, no worry about expense, kids. Uh, if we should pass, just cremate us and do whatever you need to do with it. 
Uh, don't make them into plates. I hear you can have yourself, your ashes made into a dish and have your family eat. That's sort of, yeah. Don't do that. But the same God that created everything that exists by the power of his words will have no trouble taking your ashes or your dust and putting it into a new body for you. And somebody said, well, well, cremation, it's still bad. Well, then what do you do with the guy that's a Christian that's in battle in World War I, World War II, Vietnam, and an artillery shell lands right where he's standing, and there's nothing left? He's dust instantaneously. What do you, well, I have to believe that God can create that. So, uh, Michi, when God blows the last trumpet, he will reunite her soul that's in heaven already with a new glorified body. So she doesn't have it yet. We have to wait for this last trumpet, okay? My dad that's been passed since 1986 doesn't have his glorified body yet. It happens at the last trumpet. It'll happen in a twinkling of an eye, not a wink. A twinkle is a fraction of a second. How can that be so? Again, the same God that can call everything into existence just by speaking the words can give me a supernatural body just like that. Grandpa that had a leg amputated because of diabetes, I believe when he gets his glorified body, he will have both legs. I believe Michi won't have any of those problems, whether it be congenital heart failure or asthma or any of those other problems, because she'll have a new body created by God. It will not hunger. It will not thirst. It won't go tired. Okay? It's going to happen quickly. And it's a mystery. People want to have change, and we want instantaneous change. Well, here you go. You know, I'd like to see this go away overnight, but it's not going to happen. I've got to change my diet and change my exercise, right? But this will happen instantaneously. And if we're alive and remain, so if the trumpet sounds and I'm still walking around pushing a lawnmower, Phil, my body is going to be gone. And the lawnmowers, we have have a switch on them that if you release the handle, it shuts off, right? It's called a dead man switch. That's not very good, Phil, right? <laughs> we don't want to call it that. But if the Lord returns and Phil's out here pushing the lawnmower, the mower's just going to shut off, and if you walk over to find out what happened, you're just going to see a pile of clothes because our clothes aren't saved, right? Right? You're not going to stop and fold them. I was watching a movie in which uh, the believers were changed and you look at them and the clothes are folded neatly and the guy's glasses were sitting on top. And I'm like, I don't think that he was going to stop and fold his clothes, put his shoes on the bottom and his socks and his shoes and then fold his pants and his shirt and put his glasses on top. I don't, it says a twinkling of an eye. That's momentary and I'm not going to stop and pay attention but you could find those clothes you well, how are we going to go to heaven then are we going to be without clothes well we're not going to be bothered about that because it's going to happen so quickly but revelation tells us we're going to be wearing white robes that have been washed in the blood of the lamb wow so there won't be a whole lot of fashion in heaven but we won't worry about well Corey's going to say, I like my robe better than yours, Pastor Wall, and mine's nicer. Right, we're not going to worry about that. It won't be a bother. By the way, Corey won't be in a wheelchair anymore. Did you know that? Corey will be able to walk and to talk and to run around, and whew, he'll probably be running all over the gold streets because he hasn't had much opportunity to do that. God is going to do spectacular things in that moment. And we can't understand it. Just know this. We have to change. I can't take this suit to heaven. i got to wear You've seen quick change artists? On America's Got Talent and stuff where they throw up the curtain and they put it down and they're changed already? Well, that's what God's going to do and there's not going to be any illusion or trick. It's going to be real. There's going to be a lot of confusion around because I think people are going to go around thinking, 
uh, where'd they go? Maybe a car stuck on the freeway? Maybe an airplane without a pilot? Paul talked about this in 2 Corinthians 5. We know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which isn't from heaven. Why am I groaning? So that I won't sin anymore. So that I won't ache in pain with arthritis anymore. I won't have any breathing problems. I won't have any tumors. I won't have any more cancer. It's going to be gone. That's why we want to be changed. If indeed having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. That's a reference to Genesis chapter 3. Adam and Eve were in the garden without clothing, and they were innocent. But when they ate and they sinned and rebelled against God, they said, uh, we can't be in front of God like this. We're naked. So they sewed together fig leaves, tried to cover themselves, and were hiding. When I stand before God, I want to have the robes of righteousness on, washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, and I won't be worried about sin anymore. It's gone, forgiven forever. Amen? Amen. Wow. So, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked, for we who are in this tent of flesh grown, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. So now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given us the Holy Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord. So the reverse is true. When we're with the Lord, we're absent from the body. That's what I want. Now, I'm not getting a group of people together and we're going to get in a vehicle and go out here and go the wrong way on the freeway so that we can be changed. I'll wait upon God for either him to blow the trumpet or for him to say, come on home a little early. It's okay. We're done. But I have no fear of death. Because I know. Don't threaten me with death. It's not a threat. It's a promise of something new with Jesus Christ. So, how does this happen? We're changed in a moment in a twinkling of an eye. It's going to be rapid. This corruptible, again, this corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. And we switch from death to what? Life. Death to life. Wow. So what do the facts of the resurrection mean to me? How does this play out for me? Well, it's in this chapter, actually. We're going to look at the final verse of the chapter, and then we're going to step back and look at some other verses. But what does it mean if, if this body, this flesh, just disappears? It's gone because it's been changed. I don't know, ladies or men, that you're going to have piercings in heaven. I don't know. Isn't a piercing just basically a scar? The only scars in heaven will be Jesus's, I believe. Does that mean I can't take my tattoos to heaven? I don't know. <laughs> okay? But uh, have you seen the, the little comics that says, very soon, and, and the... Old folks' homes, we're going to have everybody that's had tattoos from a very young, you know, and, and now they're old enough to be in their 70s and their 80s, and their, you know, their tattoos get faded when they get older, right? Yes? No? I don't know. I'd... And skin sags, right? They don't look the same, but they're going to be tattooed and pierced in the, those places. There's nothing wrong with that, but I don't think we'll be taking that up into heaven with us. But don't be disappointed. Don't say, well, I paid a lot of money to have that done. Don't worry about it. You won't worry about it, okay? Liposuction, <laughs> having Botox put in, um, having a facelift. I came across my thing the other day. You can have a facelift for just so much dollars. And I'm like, oh, okay. I can just keep pulling my... I'll actually have, maybe have hair in heaven. Wouldn't that be nice? 
I wish I could have it like Ezra, but it'll probably come more like my natural appearance, which is not very good. But what do these facts of the resurrection mean to me now? I know what they mean to me when I get to heaven. I'll have a new body. No more cancer, no more pain, no more sickness, no more hunger, no more thirst. But what does it mean to me now? How then should I live? Well, verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. The reason Paul wrote this chapter is because some were saying the resurrection of Jesus never happened. And so he told us how it happened. He told us what it meant by that and how we were going to be changed. And he goes, because you have this information, don't be fooled by people that say the resurrection never happens. There's a group that will go around and they'll tell you that if you join them and become part of that group, it, you might get to go to heaven. Only 144,000 people get to go to heaven. And if you don't get to go to heaven with them, then you can stay here and be a, a glorious servant of Jehovah here on the earth. Don't pay attention to them. The Bible tells you that if you've trusted in Jesus Christ, you're going to be in the presence of God. Now, in Revelation, we're getting ready to study that on Mondays and Wednesday nights. We will find out that the new Jerusalem will be actually on the earth, not in heaven. But we can go back and forth very easily. But we shouldn't be fooled. We should be steadfast and firm, knowing that no matter what happens to me, God will take care of me eventually. I have my eternal destination already set. Years ago, when I was in college, I graduated from college after five years in 1984. So I'm almost to the 40th anniversary of my college graduation. It seems impossible. But the guy that was one of my teachers and was the vice president of the college, his name was Jack Baskin. So he was in his 50s when I was in school because he's in his 90s. And he's still traveling around the world on missionary endeavors. It's pretty powerful. I would like to be doing the same thing when I'm that age, to continue serving the Lord so long. But he's steadfast and unmovable. Whatever aches and pains he's got, he knows, you know what? It'll be all right one of these days because I'll be in the presence of the Lord and I won't have to worry about that anymore. I'm going to work until Jesus comes. All right, let's look at another passage in chapter 15, verses 33 and 34. This is referring back to those that said the resurrection didn't happen. Don't be deceived. Evil company corrupts bad habits. Now that's a great verse in itself, but don't pay attention to those that are trying to say the resurrection never happened. Awake to righteousness and do not sin, for some do not have the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. So we should say, well, if God's got a new body for me, that doesn't mean I need to wear this one out sinning. I've heard it said, I, I can't quote it exactly, but somebody said, I want to just barely skid into heaven with just everything just gone with my body. And I'm like, because of sin or because you're working hard for the Lord, right? I, I don't mind wearing this body out serving the Lord, but I could very easily get into sin and wear this body out for the Lord. Well, no, it won't be for the Lord Jesus. It'll be for the Lord Satan if I allow sin to rule in my life. So I want to do the right thing. I want to live for God. I want to live for Jesus. I want to do the right thing every day. How about you? How about you? Look back into 2 Corinthians chapter 5. One last time. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 7 through 9. We walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present from the Lord. It's a continuation of what we just read, that when we're at home in our tent, we're absent from the, from the Lord. Well, here Paul says, I want to be absent from the body and present with the Lord, but... I want to make it my aim, whether present here or absent here, to be well-pleasing to him. That's what's important. 
Jesus gave a parable, and there was a phrase in that parable that's very interesting. Uh, in the parable, the master says to the servant that worked well, he says, Welcome home, my good and faithful servant. Now, the apostles never said that we would hear that when we get to heaven, but I'd like to think that maybe I will hear that, hopefully, when I get to heaven. Welcome home, a good and faithful servant. That it was said of my dad, it was said of Michi, it was said of others that have passed from this life to the next. You did the right thing, you lived the right way, you were pleasing to the Lord while you were here. You know, it's very interesting. Don't be discouraged if you didn't find Christ until later in life. Because there's another parable that the Master says, whether you came early to serve me, or halfway through to serve me, or at the very end to serve me, all that's important, they'll all get the same wages, whether you came early or middle or late. You'll all get the same. Well, amen for that. But that doesn't mean that I can just play around and do what I want to do. I better do the right thing. So I'll be changed from uncertain to steadfast. I know what's going to happen to me. I know. So if something should happen to me and you hear rumors of my death and say, Pastor Walt's past, know where I am. I'm in heaven. Yes, you might mourn that you won't see me anymore. And some of you might have a party that you don't see me anymore. I don't know. But know that I'm in the presence of the Lord. Absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Be turned from deception to the truth. Know the truth. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you have to change from your Adam or Eve suit and have a heavenly suit to be in heaven. That's what the resurrection does. Thank you, Lord, for allowing Paul to give us these facts concerning the resurrection. Are you glad that you have this so you can know the truth? I am. Because I have these facts, I will live steadfastly in my Christian walk. I'm going to keep doing the same thing. There in 1 Corinthians 5, I didn't read it to you, but you can read it yourself. Uh, Paul says, knowing the terror of the Lord, knowing that I have respect for God and what God is going to maybe say to me when I get to heaven, uh, he said, I want to do the right thing. I want to do the right thing because one of these days, When I get to heaven, I'm not going to look up my dad. I'm not going to look up my brother. I'm going to go look up Jesus. The Bible tells us there's a judgment seat for Christians. We're not sure exactly when it happens, but at some point, I'm going to stand in front of Jesus. Somebody said, will Jesus have a large green TV behind him? that he'll play all the things you didn't ask forgiveness about? Because we need to ask forgiveness, right? When we're saved, that's forgiven once and it's gone forever. But if we sin after we're saved, it's like we trample underfoot the, the body of Jesus on the cross. So we need to always be saying, I, Lord, he's helped me to find out if I'm sinning and if I am, please forgive me for that. Some have called it a sin of omission or a sin of commission. Omission means you were supposed to do something you didn't. Commission means you're not supposed to do it and you did it. But I'm going to stand before Jesus and he won't have a big screen TV. Uh, he won't have somebody there reading off my stuff. I'll open up my mouth and I'll tell him what I was doing that I shouldn't have done and what I should have done and I didn't do it because... I'm recording everything up here. You know that? You only use 10% of your brain, but your brain has a lot of memories crammed into it. To stand in front of Jesus and to see the nail prints. And if I get any rewards, I'll tell you what I'm going to do with them. I'm going to be at his feet and I'm going to place him there and say, you are worthy. Worthy is the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. I don't deserve anything. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Praise God, He'll forgive me. And I hope that I have some award, rewards to place at His feet, some crowns, some things. I can remember back all the way back in high school. I still have it somewhere. 
it was a math award because I did really well in geometry. And so they gave me a, like a med, medal to wear on my letterman's jacket that I never got. How nerdy, right? A, a, a math award. But I was very proud of that, okay? Now, you won't see me wearing it around as I have to dig it out, but it's more important what I do for Jesus Christ, what he wants me to do, to be a good husband, to be a good father, to be a good grandfather, to be a good pastor. That's what he's called me to be. Whatever God has called you to do, do it well, as unto the master. I want to be steadfast in my Christian walk so that I can stand before him and say, thank you. Thank you for allowing me in. Because I didn't deserve it. That you died for me so I could come. Thank you. Oh, death, where's your sting? We have no worries because Jesus has the victory over death. Amen? Amen? Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that these words that we've seen today in 1 Corinthians 15 will help us in our spiritual walk. Lord, that we won't be confused, we won't be in error, we'll just know that one of these days you're going to catch us away and you're going to change our bodies so that we can enter into the very presence of God. No more sin, no more illness, no more sickness, no more cancer, no more arthritis, no more hunger, no more thirst. We'll be in the presence of God for eternity with the robe of righteousness from Jesus Christ. Thank you for that. Help us then to live this life differently, knowing where our destination is, knowing what we will do, so that we won't be worried about, ah, somebody said there's no resurrection, or we won't worry about uh, just, hey, I can do whatever I want, but we'll think more about what God wants us to do. Help us to be steadfast in our walk. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, announcements. We have things coming up that need your attention. <laughs> the first thing is no Bible study tomorrow. So if you're watching online or, or you're here in the service, I'll try to make sure everybody knows I have a, a meeting I have to go to. So no, we will do coffee and prayer, but we will not do Bible study tomorrow. We will do Wednesday. Now, you should have a half sheet in your bulletin that talks about ministry opportunities. Saturday, here at the church, the middle school is going to have a rummage sale to raise money for a program they have. And I told them that we would provide hot dogs, we would cook them, and then they could sell them, and that's a way for us to be involved in our community. So if you can help, um, you need to be here about 9 o'clock on Saturday. They're going to be here at 6, I'm going to meet them to set up, but if you can be here from between 9 and about noon, we're going to just... You can come and look at the stuff and see if you want to buy stuff. It's all right with me. The church is not making any money off it, okay? It's to help the flags program at the middle school, which is a foreign language thing. So that's Saturday. Then um, in May, we have Teacher Appreciation Week. We're going to try to provide meals for them. Really, I don't need as much help with that as I do if you can donate towards that. We would like, we'd, last year, we did three separate meals. We did sandwiches and set free did street tacos one day and then uh, uh, IBTF did El Pollo Loco the third day and I would like to do five days I told the principal that we might just have to do pizza on one day and just keep bringing pizza and he said whatever they're very thankful for whatever we bring so they also have a camp out coming up that uh, we are going to do the movie night for them and I need help with that and with the popcorn. So if you can help with that, please be thinking about it. That's the 19th. Uh, you need to be at the school at 6 o'clock to help, or 5 o'clock if you can, to help with that. So we can. It doesn't take a lot to run it. We just need somebody to make popcorn and somebody to serve it. Um, basically, help me set up the theater, the screen and stuff. Um, they have a couple of other things. It's not on the calendar because I don't have it just yet, but um, they have a day they're going to want us to help set up chairs or take, put chairs away um, for their uh, sixth grade, they don't call it graduation, but a promotion. And that's usually like on a Thursday or a Friday. And then we're going to give out popsicles on another day. So I'll let you know that information as we go down the road. And we're going to have a church business meeting on the last Sunday of the month right after church. If you're a member of our church, you're allowed to vote on it. 
and uh, we are going to be talking about our budget. So I'll let you know what we did last year and what we are hoping to do this year. Okay, Mrs. Hatch? There are things again in the room. And back there, coffee and water and snacks if you want to have something to snack and fellowship with uh, after church today. All right? Uh, let's be dismissed and a word of prayer. And uh, Jerry, will you close our service, please?